Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I am Tim Walcott. I'm treasurer of the Broome County Peace Action Chapter and a member of the UUCB Social Justice Committee. This is the inaugural event of a four-year-long series of activities culminating on Gandhi's 150th birthday anniversary on October 2nd, 8, 2019. Our hope is to relight the fire of commitment to human justice and nonviolent self-determination that Mahatma Gandhi and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so eloquently expressed in their writings and actions. This event is sponsored by, and bear with me, I'm proudly, we have many, the following organizations. Broome County Peace Action, being the primary underwriter of this event. Broome County Nuclear Weapons Reduction Campaign, Inc. Broome County Veterans for Peace. Broome County Urban League. Broome Tioga NAACP. The Centenary Shenango Street United Methodist Church. Citizen Action of the Southern Tier of New York the Workers' Center of the Southern Tier, the Gandhi Commemoration Committee, and our hosts, the UCB Social Justice Committee. Finally, now is my pleasure to present to you the leader of our congregation, the Reverend Dr., excuse me, Reverend Douglas Taylor, Minister of Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Binghamton. He probably didn't mind that upgrade. <laughs> Please welcome Douglas Taylor. And getting a lot of hints, I should go get a PhD. <clears throat> One of these days, I'm busy. I've got a beautiful congregation and it is a joy to open the doors and welcome the community in to experience some of the diversity that we have and the conversations that we engage in. We are so glad there are so many of you from so many walks of life to come and join us and be here. It is a key point for Unitarian Universalists to host civil conversations and we are glad to do so. You are welcome in this space. I am glad that you are here. May you be blessed, and may our time also be blessed. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my sincere pleasure again to introduce next the originator of this idea of a multi-year commemoration of Gandhi's life. His philosophy of nonviolent action has been an inspiration to many. And Reverend Dr. Gary Dopp is a person who originated this idea that we are beginning this commemoration today. Gary has been a retired United Methodist minister since 2005, and according to his Facebook page, is loving it. <laughs> Reverend Dopp, numerous community-based social justice activities include involvement with the Broome County Library, Broome County Council of Churches Jail Ministry Program, the Upper New York Camp and Retreat Ministry, Pacha de Bene, and many more. Gary's favorite quote is by A.J. Must, quote, there is no way to peace, peace is the way. Unquote. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Gary Dodd. Tim has supplied me with some height. We, we, we got a, a, a stool in place here. It's, uh, it's hard to stand up to the stature of some of you, but uh, it is an honor to be among you in this congregation and in this community. Uh, this is a time when we are looking forward to three and a half years of thinking and acting together, perhaps emulating some of the uh, activity that uh, was carried on by Gandhi in India and King in the United States, 
One of those who is a contemporary follower of Gandhi in India said in an article I read last summer that walking is a spiritual thing always, especially when it's carried on for a common purpose, a way of lifting up humanity. And uh, many of you have been those who have walked and have put yourselves into history by walking toward a time that is not yet, a time of fulfillment when we all achieve our full stature and humanity. Sometimes as we think about the leaders of the past, of Gandhi in the 1930s and 40s, and of Dr. King in the 1960s, we think, well, you know, that is wonderful what those men were able to do, but we forget that those men uh, would not have been able to do anything without a great many other people who were nameless and sometimes rise to the level of recognition, but many times were anonymous. And uh, so those persons with the great eloquence and the insight that they brought to our social history were, were models for us. And even though we may not, not ever achieve the eloquence of a king, or the persistence and the strength of a Gandhi. We have ourselves, and we have a gift to offer. And we know that the world has actually changed because of nonviolence. It's not just been in India or just in the United States during the civil rights movement, but we can go down a long catalog of places throughout the world where substantial changes in human life have taken place through a nonviolent process of organization. And I'll leave that to our speaker to, to lay out some of that today. It is a, it's wonderful, Kevin, that you're here. And I'll leave your introduction to Tim in just a moment. Uh, but I want to simply say about our time in these next few years that we hope to bring into this process a number of constituencies, people in general, of course, but educators, clergy, teachers of uh, all kinds of descriptions, people in the medical field and the social justice and social responsibility and caring fields, people in medicine and people in counseling, people finally who operate our justice systems and our courts to realize that the people with whom they are oftentimes dealing are in moments of their greatest need, and greatest disillusionment, greatest pain, and that the ways in which we interact with persons in the times of their greatest stress is a way in which our, the healing of our society can come about. And if, if we have persons in all of these professions uh, responding to others with the kind of awareness of, of their social situation, uh, what, a, what a transformation that allows to happen. We, uh, I was heartened just a few weeks ago to read in the newspaper in a year where one revelation after another of brutality and violence had been perpetrated by officers of the law. Here was a police officer chasing a man throughout New York, upper, somewhere in upper, upper New York, upstate, and uh, the, the, the man who was attempting to get away from the police officer drove over a bank and down onto a, an icy pond. The ice was not terribly deep and the car began to crack through the ice. The police officer jumped out of his vehicle, ran and pulled the man out of his car just seconds before it disappeared in eight feet of icy water. The officer had to enter into that water himself. There are wonderful examples of where people who are serving the public interest go way beyond the expected level of responsibility. And so it is when you have come today to think together about changing the structures of our world, you too have gone beyond the level of expectation, but moving into an area where we can feel the creativity of nonviolence becoming a mode of life and a way for us forward. 
And for that, all of us are deeply grateful. And I'm so grateful for your presence with us here today and for those who have helped this occasion to take place, Tim and Fred and, and of course, Kevin. Thanks so very, very much to you all. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor to introduce Mr. Kevin Martin, President of National Peace Action. Kevin has worked for Peace Action from Washington, D.C. for 15 years, having previously been its executive director. Before that, he was a director of Project Abolition, a national organizing effort for nuclear disarmament. Mr. Martin's writings have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Nation, Los Angeles Times, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Village Voice, the Chicago Tribune, the Progressive, Z Magazine, and others. Kevin has appeared on CNN, NPR, Fox News, MSNBC, BBC television and radio. Kevin is at once personable, knowledgeable, and action-oriented. Mr. Martin's presentation is entitled, quote, Love Can Conquer Suffering, Seeking Wisdom, Joy, and Effectiveness from Gandhi and King, unquote. Let's all warmly welcome Mr. Kevin Martin. Thank you very much to uh, Tim and Gary and Douglas and everybody else who helped to put this together. And uh, I want to particularly, I, I, I don't know if this is a typical thing that people do at, at meetings or gatherings, but uh, thanking or honoring the people that traveled the farthest to get here, which in this case would probably be me, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, but Sally and David Jones came all the way from Staten Island to stop off on their way to Canada. They're uh, powerhouses within Peace Action of New York State, in case you didn't know that. Sally serving as the chair of the Peace Action Fund of New York State Board. So I want to say just a little bit about my background because I think there are a few things that are germane to our discussion today. Uh, first of all, I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So to me, I'm not a Pisces or an Aquarius, but I'm very drawn to water, both physically and metaphorically. So being on Riverside Drive right next to the Susquehanna River is wonderful to me. And of course, driving up from Washington, I think I crossed the Susquehanna three or four times uh, to get here. But I grew up 20 minutes away from uh, the Susquehanna River in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And for those of you that know the area, uh, it's chock full of Quakers and Mennonites and Amish, uh, who are, are, of course are among the most peace-loving people you could ever find. Now, when I was a child, I, I was baptized Episcopal, and I didn't know a lot about our history's background. But it turns out on my father's side, uh, there were a lot of Mennonites farmers. My great-great-great-grandfather left the farm. Well done, I'm very glad that he did. Beautiful country and, and, and farmland, but a hard life there. On my mother's side of the family, going way back, were Quaker abolitionists. And my great-great-great-great, I believe five great-grandfathers, was a guy by the name of Joseph Gardner, and he was a Quaker abolitionist in Kansas. And he was, his house was on the Underground Railroad, and he helped to establish Kansas as a free state, he and his, his contemporaries, which is another way of saying that they helped start the Civil War, although you could maybe blame that on the folks in Missouri. Uh, but anyway, during that period of the so-called Bloody Kansas or Bloody Missouri period, particularly in the 50s and 60s, uh, he participated in armed raids into Missouri to, f to free slaves and other abolitionists. So he was a Quaker, but he was no pacifist. And he and his son had to chase off uh, a gang from Missouri that came in the middle of the night and wanted to set their house on fire, and he was protecting freed slaves that were staying at his house. He actually believed so 
fervently in, in this cause. Uh, he, he was white, but he joined uh, with black troops. It was called the 1st Kansas Colored Regiment. And in 1863, he was in his late 30s, I believe, he actually died in battle in the Civil War fighting alongside black troops. So whenever people congratulate me about my work, and it's now been 30 years as a peace and social justice activist, I think, well, I'm a slacker compared to that guy. Uh, but I'm very glad to be with you here today. And I was so impressed when Tim contacted me about the idea of initiating this three and a half year series of events commemorating Gandhi because in the peace movement, uh, we don't have a lot of resources or capacity to think a month or two ahead very often, let alone three and a half years. So I, I think uh, the best thing that I, that I want to do to uh, address my remarks is about the applicability, applicability and the effectiveness of nonviolent civil resistance and mass action to today. And I started to think a little bit about, and Gary touched on this, uh, sometimes people are a little intimidated or put off by the examples of Gandhi or King. Some of it has to do with some of their personal weaknesses. They were failed human beings just like all of us, and uh, you might even say imperfect practitioners of, of their own way. Uh, on the other hand, the, the daunting or intimidating uh, thought of, well, how could I be like Gandhi? How could I be as strong and have as much discipline? Uh, how could I be like King, so charismatic? Uh, and I think those things are difficult. But the good news is that you don't have to wait for another Gandhi or another King. Nonviolence works, and it's working probably even more effectively than they would have thought. Were they alive today, I think they would be astonished to see the effectiveness of nonviolence as really the most effective uh, tool for people's liberation. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later, some very rigorous research and data on that. But I think that's the main good news that I can bring to you today, is that nonviolence works, and it works much better than violence. I want to talk about just a few of the uh, sort of most foundational precepts of Gandhi, and they're, they're tough. They're, they're uh, tough to struggle with, not the least of which is because even though Gandhi was very fluent in English, a lot of these concepts that are in Sanskrit don't really have a very good translation to English. So for example, satyagraha. Uh, literally means truth force. And truth, of course, is very important to Gandhi, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, but he talked about truth and God, whatever you consider God to be, to be inseparable, or maybe even that God is truth and that truth is God, but that actually truth sort of precedes the concept of God. Some people have also translated Satyagraha as love force or soul force, uh, but my understanding is that the best approximation from the Sanskrit translated into English is insistence on truth or holding on to truth. And I think that's a very simple way to, to think of satyagraha as being one of the most, uh, now it's, it's used in various ways, including tactically, the great salt march, march or salt satyagraha. Um, so sometimes it gets confusing about how the term is used, but I think holding on to truth or insistence on truth is a, is a good, simple thing to remember. Another foundational principle uh, which I find to be a real challenge is ahimsa, and as Gary reminded me last night, ahimsa, I guess, means harm, and ahimsa means the opposite of harm, so non-harm, not doing harm to others. Uh, Nonviolence toward all things, including ourselves, but even refraining from the capacity to engage in violence or even violent thought. Now, that's extremely challenging, but that is something that I, I try hard to live up to. Uh, I caught myself yesterday morning having an uncharitable, violent thought about somebody, and I was, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm giving a talk about Gandhi tomorrow, you know, get out of here, violent thought, go away. Uh, and it is a discipline, definitely, to think that way. So Gandhi, of course, was very much influenced by uh, the Jainists in uh, Hindu in Gujarat, in Western India. 
who wear, some, wear masks so that they won't even inhale germs or microbes. That, that's their level of commitment to non-harm, to ahimsa. They don't even want to harm microbes in the air as they breathe. Now, that's very difficult for anyone to aspire to, uh, but that is, is quite a, a commitment. And Gandhi was also very much uh, influenced by the example of the Buddha in Buddhism. And I found a great passage uh, from the Buddha that takes this uh, uh, ahimsa concept uh, pretty far. The thought manifests as the word. The word manifests as the deed. The deed develops into habit, and habit hardens into character. So watch the thought and its ways with care, and let it spring from love born out of concern for all beings. As the shadow follows the body, as we think, so we become. There's also in uh, the Zoroastrian tradition uh, a, 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 a corollary of right speech, right thought, right action. Similar in another different uh, religious tradition. And of course, when you look at the roots of Hinduism and Buddhism and how that influenced Gandhi, it's also very important to understand the nonviolent roots of Islam as well. And of course, Islam means peace. And a contemporary of Gandhi, who unfortunately doesn't get as much study or respect, Badshah Khan, uh, was somebody who was very close. He was a Muslim from the Pashtun area, I guess, which would now be Afghanistan or Afghanistan and Pakistan. And he actually formed the first so-called nonviolent people's army of 80,000 people. And he was a contemporary of Gandhi uh, and somebody that they were very close and influenced each other and someone who deserves a lot more study as well. So uh, when I was invited, and by the way, Tim was absolutely fantastic in terms of communicating with me to do this. And I'm no Gandhi scholar or King scholar, and I'm a very imperfect practitioner of their ways. But uh, he really, Tim, encouraged me to revisit and focus on the seven deadly social sins, which are awesome. And they're on this bookmark, which hopefully most of you have gotten. <laughs> And uh, when I went to look it up, I first started to think I would go directly to Gandhi, but then I found uh, what I thought was a very good uh, explanation by his grandson, Arun Gandhi, who uh, teaches uh, at just uh, up the road in Rochester, not, not far away. So I'm going to go over these very quickly and then come back to a few of them. Politics without principles, which I think is one of the most important ones for me that I personally think about a lot, particularly given our craven politics in this day and age. Wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, and I sort of thought of a corollary, which is technology without common sense, which we seem to be enamored of in this country. Uh, worship without sacrifice. So those are the, the seven, uh, sometimes called seven deadly social sins, sometimes called seven blunders of the world. Now, when I look at these, and I don't know if others have looked at this, there, there's an aspect which is difficult in terms of personal responsibility, which I think people should try to examine and live up to. Um, it can seem a little preachy sometimes, and there are some parts of this that I don't necessarily agree with. But I think it's important not just to look at it in terms of individual terms and how you can try to live better, uh, a better life by, by paying attention to these, but also for me, socially and societally, and are there structures in our society that cause us or that we've created. Uh, and, and when I get to talking about King, I'm going to crystallize it even a little bit shorter. On politics without principles, and again, this is Arun Gandhi, the grandson of Mohandas Gandhi. Firmly, he said that those who believe in nonviolence should never stand for elections, but they should elect representatives who are willing to understand and practice the philosophy. And he, uh, of course, Gandhi was an attorney early in life, and he uh, had, I think, a good way to think about this, that your elected representatives, you're sort of giving them your power of attorney. But it's conditional. You can withdraw that power of attorney if they're not doing their job the way you think they ought to be doing it. <clears throat> when politicians indulge in power games, they act without principles. To remain in power at all cost is unethical, according to Gandhi. And he said that whenever they give up the pursuit of truth, again, holding on to truth, satyagraha, uh, they would be doomed. And he goes on to talk about uh, politics having a reputation of being dirty, but that's really our fault that we've allowed that to happen. It's not that politicians are, by some nature, bad people or anything like that. It's our human construct. 
And uh, Arun Gandhi said, so who is to blame for the mess we find ourselves in? And I can't think of a better exhibit than this, than the, the current, uh, uh, especially presidential election. And I'm gonna get a little bit later to my own personal, this very briefly, my own personal beliefs and also peace actions. Uh, my normal rule of thumb in terms of presidential elections is anyone who's willing to do what it takes to get elected should be disqualified from even running. <laughs> I, I will say though that in this election we will have several exceptions to that. I think in the Democratic primary Bernie Sanders is one and I'm supporting him and so is peace action. And I'm not saying that on partisan terms on behalf of the church or anybody else. Uh, Jill Stein or other Green Party candidates also would fit that as well. Second deadly sin, wealth without work. This includes playing the stock market. Well, I do have some investments in the stock market, but they're in socially responsible funds. Gambling, sweatshop slavery, overestimating one's worth, like some heads of corporations drawing exorbitant salaries which are not always commensurate with the work they do. That doesn't happen in peace action, by the way, believe me, okay? <laughs> With capitalism and materialism spreading so rampantly around the world, the gray area between an honest day's hard work and sitting back and profiting from other people's labor is growing wider. And of course, that is another big point of contention in this presidential election and the astonishing accumulation of wealth, the income inequality in this country, which is just, it's sickening to me uh, that you have, you know, one-tenth of, I think, I think I, the most recent statistic I saw was there are 61 individuals who have as much wealth as half the world's population. Astonishing to me. And I think the best way that Gandhi uh, termed this is there enough for everyone's, there's enough for everyone's need but not for everyone's greed. Pleasure without conscience. This is interesting, and Gandhi talked about this as being connected to wealth without work. And I think this has kind of accelerated, and if he were alive today, would probably have even more to say about this. Uh, people find imaginative and dangerous ways of bringing excitement to their otherwise dull lives. Their search for pleasure and excitement often end up costing society very heavily. The United States spends more than $250 billion a year on leisure activities while 25 million children die each year because of hunger, malnutrition, and lack of medical facilities. Gandhi believed that pleasure must come from within the soul and that excitement from serving the needy, from caring for the family, the children, and relatives. Building sound human relationships can be an exciting and adventurous activity. Knowledge without character. This has a lot to do with our obsession, particularly in this society, with materialism. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more when I get to King. Where people are more concerned about acquiring knowledge so that they can have a better job or the prestige or higher pay. And often, unfortunately, that's what our educational system is directed to. I'm sure there are probably a lot of teachers here today who can attest to that and can say that they've personally struggled against that. Teachers and nurses are by far always the two professions in terms of peace action supporters and activists that are uh, the most prevalent. Um, our educational centers have emphasized career, career building and not character building. Again, knowledge without character. Gandhi believed if one is not able to understand oneself, how can one understand the philosophy of life? And Gandhi said an education that ignores character building is an incomplete education. And I think that's true, and I struggle with this with my own children who are both in college now. Uh, and to me, I, I do want to see that they get, get good grades and all that, but to me the most important thing is, is developing critical thinking and the ability to question. And I get a lot of that in my house, that's for sure. Commerce without morality. When profit making becomes the most important aspect of business, morals and ethics usually go overboard. We cut benefits and even salaries of employees. And there's a particular aspect to this when you get to a lot of peace actions work around working to cut the Pentagon budget, where you have Lockheed Martin and other merchants of death who their main concern is not jobs, it's profit. They often hold communities hostage. So the F-35 disastrous airplane doesn't work, most expensive weapon system ever. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, Bernie Sanders is supporting it because some of them are based in Vermont. Uh, Lockheed Martin is, is threatening to cut thousands of jobs now, and it's, it's hostage taking is what it is. They don't care about jobs, they care about profit, and they profit from war and death. And we need to call that out that that's what they're doing. 
Uh, if, if possible, we employ slave labor like the sweatshops and migrant farm workers in New York and California and, of course, all other places around this country. And then to add insult to injury, we treat them poorly. And our racism shows and people like Donald Trump say, let's build a wall over Mexico and make the Mexicans pay for it. What a ridiculous, stupid, fascist idea when the people from Mexico are picking our food and are taking care of our elderly and working their butts off. Uh, you know, so Gandhi, of course, saw this very clearly in India with the caste system as well. Profit supersedes the needs of people. When business is unable to deal with labor, it begins to mechanize. Mechanization, it is claimed, increases efficiency, but in reality is instituted simply to make more money. Alternate jobs may be created for a few, others will fall by the wayside in language. Who cares? People don't matter, profits do. Science without humanity. This is science used to discover increasingly more gruesome weapons of destruction that threaten to eventually wipe out humanity. And it's, it's, a lot of these are, are self-reinforcing or connected. Uh, materialism has made us possessive. The more we possess, the more we need to protect, and so the more ruthless we become. Now, Arun Gandhi talks about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the precedent that that set, not that there weren't horrific war crimes crea uh, created before that, but he talks about that, that in terms of the ultimate in destruction um, and uh, falling into this category. And he says, war is sometimes inevitable only because we are such ardent nationalists that we quickly label ourselves by our country of origin, by gender, by the color of our skin, by the language we speak, or by the religion we, pra we practice, so on. And of course, these labels dehumanize us and we become mere objects. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, a corollary technology without common sense, everything from video games to fracking and drones and nuclear weapons. Just because we can invent these things, should we? Shouldn't we have evolved to a higher level of humanity to say, no, these things are wrong? And I'm not saying get rid of all video games. That was a real struggle with my son. One time we were at a video game store and it was his birthday and I owed him, a I, owed him I was buying him a video game. And he picked this thing off the shelf that was ridiculously violent. And I looked at this for a few minutes and I said, no way, Max, I'm not buying this for you. And he said, that's the trouble with having peace activist parents. <laughs> But to me, it also goes beyond that. And uh, I think that partly why it's so important that people join and support groups like Peace Action. Uh, and you know, every place I travel in the country, if, if we're having an event, it's likely at a church and it's really likely to be a Unitarian church. And so you know, Unitarians are always such great allies. Matter of fact, a couple weeks ago in Washington, I chaired a meeting of the Syria-Iraq working group. We had a day-long planning meeting in Washington, DC at the, at the uh, Unitarian church. But there are so many forces in our society of atomization. Go to your job where there's no democracy, there's no unions, forget about it, very few unions. You have no say, no democracy in the workplace. You have crappy benefits, probably don't have much time off, probably don't have many holidays, probably don't have much in the way of health care, although Obamacare has helped a little bit. Go home, get on the internet, watch TV, and buy crap. You know, that's a lot of the forces of atomization in our society, and I think that's not a life for people, and it's certainly not a community. So to become active and effective in taking action to build a more peaceful and just world, you have to do it collaboratively and, and building community. Because if you do it by yourself, it's very lonely and very difficult. Lastly, worship without sacrifice. One person's faith is another person's fantasy because religion has been reduced to meaningless rituals practiced mindlessly. Temples, churches, synagogues, mosques, mosques and those entrusted with the duty of interpreting religion to lay people seek to control through fear of hell, damnation, and purgatory. And again, we certainly see that in some of our politics on the right in this country. True religion is based on spirit, spirituality, love, compassion, understanding, and appreciation of each other, whatever our beliefs may be. Christians, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, agnostics, or whatever. Gandhi believed whatever labels we put on our faith, ultimately, all of us worship truth because truth is God. Again, getting back to that uh, fundamental concept. So again, I think that if we look at these, I think they are incredibly uh, still relevant, maybe unfortunately so, to our current society and certainly here in the United States. 
I don't expect everybody to go around thinking about these every day, but this bookmark is a great way to help remind us. So I uh, struggle sometimes with my own uh, accessibility or feelings about both Gandhi and King, and they may be different than, than other people's. And as I was preparing for this talk, I, I expected to have more trouble sort of diving back into Gandhi than King, but it turned out it was the reverse. I had more trouble uh, diving back into King, even though I quote King very often and I think about King and the Civil Rights Movement a lot. The thing that I think is most uh, relevant, and again on a personal level, but also especially a social or societal level, is what King called the triple evils or giant triplets of American society. So we're coming up on the anniversary of his death. April 4th, 1968 was when he was murdered. A year to the day before that, he gave a great speech at Riverside Church in New York City called Beyond Vietnam. And he did this on other occasions as well, but it's where he linked the civil rights struggle with the struggle against the war in Vietnam and also against nuclear weapons. The triple evils that King enumerated are racism, militarism, and extreme materialism or economic exploitation. And I'm not usually a super wordsmith on things like this, but sometimes the third one gets called poverty. And I actually don't think that's very helpful, because I think poverty sounds helpless to me. Well, there's always been poverty. There will always be poor people. Extreme materialism is something that you can understand and decide, is that what I want in my life, or is that what uh, our society should worship? And economic exploitation, even more so. Somebody is doing something to somebody else. Somebody is exploiting somebody else. So I think in enumerating the, the triple evils, either extreme materialism or uh, economic exploitation are the better ways to do it. Now, uh, King would certainly argue, and did argue, that these are intricately linked. And without going into all three, because I think if you're here, you understand that these are illnesses that plague our society, um, thinking about how they connect. Certainly, US foreign policy and war making is racist. There's no way to get around that. So if you look at the connection between militarism and racism, it's there for all to see. And that's despite what's often claimed that, well, the military is a great place for African Americans or Latinos or Asians or people of color. Uh, that may be true in a few cases, such as Colin Powell, but all of, especially the, the African American veterans that I know, say that the racism that they faced in the military was worse than even society at large. So again, that's not to discount that there may be individuals that have had good experiences in terms of people of color in the military, or women, or gays, or whoever, but uh, overall, that's not the message that I've heard from the people that I've talked to that have been in the military. And again, making the connection that US foreign policy and militarism and war making is explicitly racist. One of the things that is astonishing to me, there's a little quiz here. So if you take 1776 Declaration of Independence as the beginning of this country, uh, we've been at war for all but how many years? Does anybody know? And if you've heard me say this before, no, not you, Sally. Uh, if you've heard me say this before, then keep quiet. So, so it's 240 years of our existence. How many of those years have we not been at war? 21. If it was a person that could now drink alcohol. That's just astonishing. And I think most Americans wouldn't get that, or they would say, are you right about that? And they'd want to look it up. Or they'd have a lot of excuses and rational issues. Well, other countries are always at war, too. Well, no, they're not. Most countries' foreign policies are defend your borders and participate in UN-approved uh, international peacekeeping. So the fact that we are deeply sick with militarism is something that I think we're in denial about. I think we're certainly in denial about the level of institutionalized racism and also about uh, uh, extreme exploitation, economic exploitation, but I, I think maybe it's arguable, but of the three, if not the worst, it's among the worst in terms of our level of denial as a society about how sick we are with militarism. Now, both King and Gandhi preached a lot about uh, truth, as I talked about, about love, but also the gospel of strategy. I think they were both very good strategists. Now, there are a lot of people that, that thought Gandhi was a little too accommodationist at times, and there were times when he had masses of people behind him, and then the British gave a little crumb of negotiation, and then he backed off too far. And I think that's a, a worthy thing to explore. 
Um, one of the things I think that is true for Gandhi and less so for King, but that I somewhat struggle with, is in the uh, exploration of nonviolence, the role of coercion. And I'm going to get to that in a bit. I'm not comfortable with coercion, but I understand how it is very important in nonviolent civil resistance. Again, the good news, though, is that even if you have qualms with all of this, nonviolence is working, and it's working better than Gandhi or King could have even dreamed of. And I'm going to cite now, this is an article that was in the Washington Post two months ago, so mainstream media, and Washington Post, believe me, is no liberal paper anymore. It's somebody who lives there. Uh, this was a month ago, or two months ago, how the world is proving Martin Luther King right about nonviolence. And the authors are a woman named Erica Chenoweth, who teaches at the University of Denver, and Maria J. Stephen, who is at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And they've been conducting very rigorous research on international campaigns of nonviolent civil resistance. They put out a book in 2011, and what this was was kind of updating it since 2011, because 2011 being such a watershed year in terms of nonviolent resistance with the Arab Spring that started in Tunisia. And uh, I want to start with a quote from King. I left India more convinced than ever that nonviolent resistance was the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom. So the article starts that since 2011, the world has been a deeply contentious place. Although arms insurgencies rage across the Middle East, the Sahel, and Southern Asia, violent civil conflicts are no longer the primary way that people seek to redress their grievances. Instead, from Tunis to Tahrir Square, from Zuccotti Park to Ferguson, from Burkina Faso to Hong Kong, movements worldwide have drawn the lessons of Gandhi and King and everyday activists at home and abroad to push for change. Now, what I think is important about this, and then you can also go back into the 90s, the Velvet Revolutions in Europe, the People Power Rev Revolution uh, in uh, the Philippines, uh, the nonviolent revolutions which are not well uh, studied or, or acknowledged because it was over, over, uh, come by the war in Yugoslavia. The first, uh, especially particularly in Kosovo, the first nonviolent campaigns there were astonishing. They were so well organized, they got people to pay alternative taxes to support the alternative government. Now, this is before NATO came in and, start, and started bombing. But even in the end, it wasn't NATO's bombs that got Milosevic uh, to step down in Yugoslavia. As a matter of fact, our bombing prolonged him staying in power, which is almost always what violence does, it, especially from external violence. Even if people hate their leaders, they rally around because they don't like being attacked. They don't like being bombed from outside. It was the nonviolent student campaign in Belgium grade that finally got rid of Milosevic. And believe it or not, the, the U.S. military actually understands that. The U.S. military actually invested in helping to train the students, the nonviolent student activists in Belgrade. Gandhi's and King's emphasis on nonviolent resistance are certainly not without critics. And a lot of that has to do with the misunderstanding of what nonviolent civil resistance is, uh, while others doubt how it can be effective against a very powerful and ruthless opponent. So what's important about this work by Chenoweth and Stephen is that they really drill into uh, data on this going back to 1900. And these are some of their important findings. First of all, nonviolent resistance is effective not necessarily because of its conversion potential, melting the hearts of your adversary. That can happen, it does happen. But because of its creative, co-optive, and coercive potential, a theory that Albert Einstein Institution founder Gene Sharp has articulated for decades. That's also true of the writings of Barbara Deming, if you studied. And they were not uh, as squeamish as I am, say, about the, the, the aspect of coercion in nonviolent civil resistance. So they have six uh, key findings. Nonviolent campaigns have become increasingly common, whereas the frequency of violent uh, insurgencies, defined as a 1,000 ba battle death threshold, has declined since the 1970s. Campaigns relying primarily on nonviolent resistance have skyrocketed. In the first five years of this current decade alone, we have seen more onsets of new nonviolent campaigns than during the entire 1990s, and almost as much as during the entire 2000s. Number two, although they are more common, the absolute success rate of nonviolent resistance campaigns have declined recently. And this is interesting because there is, it's, it's more anecdotal, but the success of nonviolent resistance campaigns is forcing an adaptation on the 
behalf of the dictators or the rulers who want to stay in power. And this we shouldn't necessarily take as a bad sign. Nonviolent resistance or nonviolence is basically in its infancy, especially compared to violence and war making. Activists employing methods of nonviolent action may sometimes be learning the wrong lessons. And you have to look at each case of nonviolent campaigns that succeed, what were the various factors. And I think that there's been too little academic study of this. However, believe it or not, nonviolent campaigns are still succeeding more often than violence. Uh, so from 1900 to 2015, so 115 years, nonviolent campaigns succeeded 54% of the time, or excuse me, 51% of the time, whereas violent campaigns succeeded 27% of the time. So far this decade, 30% of nonviolent campaigns have succeeded, whereas 12% of violent campaigns have succeeded. Meaning, in fact, the proportional success gap between them is now actually wider than average. And I want to cite another uh, unusual source, the Rand Corporation, no peaceniks, uh, their study long term of so-called terrorist or violent insurgent campaigns has found that they've only been defeated militarily about 12% of the time. They actually confirm that uh, the way that, that violent insurgents or terrorist uh, campaigns are overcome is through diplomacy, through nonviolent action, uh, through uh, 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 what's the word, through uh, reconciliation, et cetera, that, that defeating them militarily has only happened 12% of the time. Then even within, uh, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, within nonviolent campaigns, a so-called violent flank or certain folks who will adopt certain violent tactics uh, it actually usually backfires because there is sometimes the argument, and a lot of nonviolent campaigns are not 100% Nonviolent. Not everybody is always nonviolent. But what happens, unfortunately, is that a higher frequency of, of nonviolent protests, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the, that uh, uh, regarding the efficacy of, of even a, a violent flank. Um, this was a guy, Omar Wassell of Princeton University, uh, leveraging data on urban protests by black Americans during the 1960s, shows that a, a higher frequency of nonviolent protests led to higher support for the civil rights movement, whereas a higher frequency of violent protests led to greater support for so-called law and order. And you still see that today, and there's actually a long-lasting uh, 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 aspect to this. And certainly that's Donald Trump's fear that he's playing on, fear of the other, of people of color, and calling for law and order. So this has a lot to do with what's called the third party effect, that nonviolence campaigns attract much more support from bystanders from third parties than violent campaigns do. Also more participation, more direct participation. Number five, nonviolent conflicts are exceedingly difficult to predict. And it's very interesting because they're, they're looking at this as political scientists being very, very rigorous. And they talk about, unlike armed campaigns, coup d'etats, or state collapse, all of which scholars are fairly good at predicting, nonviolent mass campaigns can happen almost anywhere for any reason. They often happen in places where scholars would expect it to be very difficult to mobilize dissent much less to mobilize dissent effectively. So Tunisia in 2011 was a great example. It really wasn't well predicted. You had this dictator that had been in, in power for 23 years. But it wasn't that all of a sudden a nonviolent protest in the streets in three weeks got rid of him. There was a lot of support over time from unions in Tunisia. But still, that's one aspect that was present there that sometimes isn't in other places. Lastly, repression challenges all dissident campaigns, but does not necessarily predetermine the choice of nonviolent resistance or its outcome. One popular argument about nonviolent resistance is that it can happen and maybe succeed as long as the adversary plays nice. Uh, there's all kinds of examples where that wasn't true, where the adversary didn't play nice. And they go into uh, a lot of the, the data around that. So again, the good news is not that you have to wait for another Gandhi or King, or that you have to be like Gandhi or King. The good news is that nonviolence works, and it works better than violence, and it's spreading around the world. I want to uh, finish with just a few notes and thinking about the future, and then we'll have some time for question and answers. So Tim, Tim read the, uh, the title of my speech, which was Love Can Conquer Suffering, Seeking Wisdom, Joy, and Effectiveness from Gandhi and King. So the first part of that, Love Can Conquer Suffering, is a line from a song called Peace on Earth by my favorite band. They're called Railroad Earth, and they're from not far from here. They're in northwestern rural New Jersey. And the Seeking Wisdom, Joy, and Effectiveness from Gandhi and King, I chose those words uh, very specifically. I think if we are going to succeed, we need effectiveness, but we also need wisdom and joy. The second half of the title, which we decided to delete, 
was to avert ecocide and build the beloved community with whatever time we have left. And we both decided that was maybe a little bit of a downer. <laughs> now let me just unpack that for a second. Uh, I certainly don't know the future better than anybody else, but there are some climate scientists, and so forget about nuclear war killing us all, that could certainly happen, and that's the issue that my organization that I have worked on the longest to, to abolish nuclear weapons. But the pace of climate change, I think, is astonishing. Even a lot of the scientists have been working on this for a long time. There are young climate scientists choosing not to have children because they just don't think there's going to be a future worthy of bringing uh, children into the world. Uh, there's at least one climate scientist who says he'll be surprised if humanity makes it into the year 2030. And he talks about our system of food distribution could collapse in as little as three weeks. And these are daunting things to think about. Certainly for young people, I try to talk to my kids about this, and they deflect it, and they should, because I don't think 20-year-olds should be thinking about, my gosh, the world could end in the next few decades. However, I think building the beloved community that King talked about is something that's worthy of all of us, regardless of whatever time we have left. And I don't know that it's 15 years. I certainly hope it's not. But I wouldn't say it's hundreds. I think, if, especially if you look at things like the seven deadly sins and the, the triple evils, we're not necessarily on the best path. And so we need to turn that ship around. And to me, this is, uh, gets to a question of hope. A lot of people have been asking me lately, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is people taking action and building community and being effective. And I get up and go to work and do what I do every day, not because I have some prognostication about the odds of being successful. I do it because I think it's the right thing to do. And I think that's what we should be doing, whether you think there's 15 years left or 5,000 years left in humanity. Uh, and uh, particularly when it comes to climate change, if we don't address militarism and racism and economic exploitation and the destruction of the planet, it's really hard to see how we are going to have that much time left. So one of the things that uh, I read, uh, reread this morning uh, was from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen master, Buddhist monk, who unfortunately probably doesn't have a lot of time left with us. And uh, this is how he talks about how we should walk on the earth. Although we walk all the time, our walking is usually more like running. When we walk like that, we print anxiety and sorrow on the earth. We have to walk in a way that we only print peace and serenity on the earth. We can all do this provided that we want it very much. Any child can do it. If we can take one step like this, we can take two, three, four, and five. When we are able to take one step peacefully and happily, we are working for the cause of peace and happiness for the whole of humankind. Walking meditation is a wonderful practice. And I know I have a hard time with this myself, to slow down and breathe and focus on that. He goes on to say, be aware of the contact between your feet and the earth. Walk as if you are kissing the earth with your feet. We have caused a lot of damage to the earth. Now it is time for us to take good care of her. We bring our peace and calm to the surface of the earth and share the lesson of love. Now, I don't know that you're all going to go away today that every step is like kissing the earth, but I think that's a great metaphorical but also realistic thing to strive for. I want to end with just two pieces of good news that I've just heard about recently that could fit into this wonderful series. And again, I'm so pleased to have been invited to help inaugurate this and the fact that you have a three and a half year plan, which is stunning to me because nobody does that. Um, the first is uh, something that I just learned about recently called the Nonviolent Cities Initiative. And it was started in Carbondale, Illinois, which is a small town. I, I was the director and I lived in Chicago for 10 years. It's the far southern tip of Illinois. It's, it's almost Appalachia, really. You go across the river, you're in Kentucky. Uh, it's been a coal mining region, industrial region. It's also a college town, Southern Illinois University. They started something there called Nonviolent Carbondale. And people got together and they had some resources from the public library and from churches and peace groups. And they meet and they have committees to talk about how to make their city more peaceful, more nonviolent. And I think it's a great idea. And Pache e Bene, which Tim mentioned, an organization that my friend John Deere works for, they've now started something called the Nonviolent Cities Initiative. So over the next three and a half years, you guys could think about what would nonviolent Binghamton look like, or maybe peaceful 
sold Binghamton. And I think that's something worth talking about. Would it be called, would it be better called, would it attract more support if it were called peaceful Binghamton or nonviolent Binghamton? But this can be everything from, you know, community police relations, uh, schools, better funding for housing, you know, what are the most important needs in this community, up to cutting the Pentagon budget and advocating nuclear disarmament and peace. And it's up to the people in the community to decide. And the other thing, and, and I'm one who is very, uh, critical sometimes of technology, but it also has its benefits, and arrived in my email on my phone this morning, a campaign I hadn't heard of, and bringing into the room another giant of peace and nonviolence, Henry David Thoreau. Folks in Western Massachusetts, not too long, uh, not too far from here, are uh, resisting the desire to build a 53 mile long uh, fracking gas pipeline through Western Massachusetts. And uh, they are taking uh, example from Henry David Thoreau, his famous uh, On Civil Disobedience essay in 1949. Uh, they're actually building a replica of, uh, of Thoreau's cabin at Walden Pond right in the path of where this is supposed to go. And they're doing a 53 mile walk and they're talking about building replicas of this cabin all along the way to uh, I'm choking up just thinking about it, to, to show people what the, what the alternatives are and what a better example would be for the earth in building this fracking part, pipeline. So uh, again, my main uh, thing to do is to thank all of you and to bring you some of this good news about peace and nonviolence and how, yes, indeed, regardless of what, thing, what you might think of Gandhi or King, it works and it works better than even they would have dreamed before they died. Thank you very much for all you do. I think for us as peace advocates, there are really two uh, parallel uh, tasks. And the one is to do whatever we can to get our message out in the mainstream media, but also recognize the mainstream media is mostly interested in profit, not necessarily in telling the truth, and that we need to build up our own alternative media. And I was talking to Tim about this this morning. Um, in my new role in the organization, I hope to have more time for writing and speaking and traveling. And one of the first things I do when I sit down to write these days is, am I going for a mainstream audience or am I going for alternative, independent, progressive audience? And I think that we need to do both. We need to get our message out as well as we can in the mainstream media, but also build up our own media because they're not going to do the job for us. And if you look at some of those important nonviolent campaigns, um, the media is often controlled, uh, much worse in other countries than it is here. So if you look in uh, Egypt, for example, uh, and Tunisia, a lot of that was done by text. So you have to be worried about is the kill switch for the internet and for, you know, for uh, electronic communications and all of that. But you, know, you have to understand that the mainstream media is not going to do our job for us. I'm someone that struggles against the... Um, uh, wrong interpretation of peace, that if you're for peace, you're a wimp or something like that, that you're weak, uh, particularly in, say, U.S. foreign policy. I think peace is one of the highest human ideals. It's one of the highest ideals of every religion. The word Islam means peace. Uh, in, in Russian, the word for world and peace is the same, mir. Mir means both world and peace. I think people want peace in their families, in their households, in their community, in the world. And I think we shouldn't ever give that up and let the militarists, the warmongers, make peace somehow a wimpy word or something like that. If you Google uh, nonviolent Carbondale, and it's Carbondale, Illinois, not Carbondale, PA, which is just close here. Uh, I'm all for nonviolent <laughs> Carbondale, PA as well. Um, they have uh, established uh, what I think are some really good uh, ways of engaging community dialogue and participation, uh, the peace groups, the library, certain churches and, and faith-based organizations have all been involved from the get-go. And to me, also putting on my community organizer hat, which is the primary hat I usually wear, uh, you don't necessarily want to predetermine what the community's priorities would be, but I bet you addressing poverty would certainly be one. And so they've got, if, so you could look at, if you, if you check out Nonviolent Carbondale, also Pace e Bene, which is uh, Latin or Italian or both, for peace and all good, they've now started this Nonviolent Cities Initiative. And I got an email about it this week, and my friend John Deere had an article published again just this week. So it's, it's fairly brand new kind of hot stuff. 
And it seems to me, and, and it's, that's part of my job is when I travel around the country is to give you guys more work to do, you know, when I leave and I get to go somewhere else, right? But it seems to me it would fit perfectly with the community connections you have and that I've seen just from being here less than 24 hours and, um, you know, the groups that are sponsoring this event today and this three and a half year series because uh, one of the things I think is if you look at sort of what are the institutionalized problems of racism or poverty or police violence or whatever it is in a community, there's always urgent priorities that you want to tackle. But if you're looking at it from an institutionalized and longer term perspective, and this three and a half year process of celebrating Gandhi gives you a, a timeline that you could use, I think that can be effective in both ways, both for the longer term and then if you do need to mobilize more quickly around a crisis, you've already established uh, your, your community relationships, probably a lot of which you already have, but probably that could be strengthened. I think the integration of those issues and those struggles, and again, King's platform, or whatever you want to call it, of the giant triplets or the triple evils, is, is very easy for people to understand if you engage people in talking about the interconnection between racism, militarism, and ex extreme materialism, and they all collaborate to provoke, to provoke and promote more violence in society, no question. Um, so I think that, that building the beloved community is part of that, of, of making those connections. One thing, though, that that reminds me of, so two terrific nonviolent struggles in this area uh, uh, against the, the drone base at Hancock, and that's, of course, also going on in other places around the country, and against the ridiculous plan to store uh, waste gases from fracking under Seneca Lake, which I just can't even imagine a more cockamamie stupid idea than that, have been you know, remarkably successful. The research that uh, I was talking about that Chenoweth and Stephen have done, Stephen, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, is what they call maximalist, I, I define that. So it's more about either liberating a country from uh, tyranny or establishing your own country or your, your own independence or whatever it is. So looking at it in the United States context about nonviolent civil resistance to address this issue or this policy, they haven't done so much of that, or if they have, I haven't read enough about that. Uh, I think the research, the data would show again that it is more effective certainly than violent resistance in this country, uh, but that's something I think we need to look at. There are some terrific projects around the country, one that I'm familiar with from Philadelphia, which is uh, former offenders or former prisoners organizing for all kinds of not only economic and social justice issues, but also education and services and registering to vote, et cetera, former prisoners. And again, making system systemic links between racism, the failure of the war on drugs, the ridiculous criminalization of marijuana and other things, and you know, nonviolent drug offenses. It's absurd how many people we lock up in this country. But then the, the, you know, the for-profit, uh, 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 criminal industrial complex, what do they call it? Uh, incarceration industrial complex, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's just scandalous. In, in small towns around this country, that's often the biggest employer is the county jail, the state thing or whatever, and they're often run by for-profit corporations. My son goes to college in Juniata uh, in Pennsylvania, this small town called Huntington. Well, the two things there are the college, Juniata, and the state penitentiary, and it's just, it's just ridiculous. And the, the juxtaposition of that is just so striking. Um, but I think that definitely should be a strong focus for folks that are looking at what are uh, you know, community priorities to address here in Binghamton, or Broome County. So what Trump and his supporters either are promoting or reacting to is mostly fear. Economic insecurity is one of them. Uh, and you know, sort of writ large, when you look at the forces of peace versus the forces of darkness, Fear is really all they have. They don't have any solutions. They don't have any hope. They don't have a better future. That's all they have is fear. Uh, for me, Trump is such a galvanizing or polarizing figure because in a lot of ways, he's the enemy, not the standard bear. And I shouldn't say enemy. He's the problem or part of the problem. And uh, engaging people who have somehow bought his message, I think is gonna be extremely difficult. Uh, I certainly believe in dialogue and in um, transformation, and certainly King talked about where, as coercion was part of nonviolent civil resistance, ultimately you're not really trying to defeat the adversary, you're trying to transform the relationship to one of higher and better understanding. You know, you can only dance with who comes to the party. So if Trump supporters or others are not open to that message, 
you can't really force them to be. But if you're able to get them, and the problem is I think a lot of, with Trump and his supporters, it's, it's a clenched fist, right? It's not an open hand to shake or to high five, right? Speaking metaphorically. If you're able to get them to talk, well, now wait a minute, what does this failed businessman who uh, inherited a bunch of money from his daddy, uh, bankrupted a whole bunch of companies, had this asinine television show that was unwatchable, what does he have to do with your life? And you have a lot more in common with working class Mexicans and Muslims coming to this country to seek a new opportunity. Those are the people you have something in common with, not this jackass. Now, I wouldn't say that. I would, I would say it much more welcomingly. But I don't expect that conversation to go well. I, I, expect, I, I expect I might have to duck, duck a flying fist. Um, so I think when you can seek those kinds of openings, you should. And maybe there are some ways to do it with media. Maybe Wilton could host a panel about this or think about how to get that message out there. Because I think if you get people to unclench, unclench the fist and really look at what's going on, they would see that there's nothing there that Trump doesn't, there's nothing that Trump's going to do for them. Well, I think certainly most universities now have uh, some kind of peace studies program, but I often think they're somewhat depoliticized and not so activist oriented. But it certainly has to start a lot sooner than that. I think it has to start in, in preschool. And I think it does for a lot of people in preschool. And I think you are seeing uh, among young people in this country, particularly in things like the support for the Sanders campaign, they're not going to be red baited. They're not afraid of being called socialists. What do they care? They don't remember uh, the Cold War or anything like that. And young people, in my experience, have a much higher expectation of diversity and inclusion. And I would bet it, within five years or so, young people are going to be saying, what do you mean there was a time when gay people couldn't marry? What, was that in the Stone Age, or when was that, right? The, you know, the pace of change can be very, very quickly, very, happen very quickly. Um, but I think, you know, talking to people when they're young about how nonviolence is wrong and counterproductive and usually provokes counterviolence, there's it's never too soon to start that as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I think within Peace Action, for example, and particularly Peace Action New York State, is one of the best in terms of our affiliates and chapters around the country in investing in student and youth outreach. When I was in New York uh, a few weeks ago, New York City, because uh, I'm in New York now, I should say New York City, shouldn't I? Uh, we had a, a great sort of major donor reception on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I think I was probably the youngest person there, or just about the youngest person there. But then we went and had a reception at a local saloon with students and young people, and I, and I was the oldest person there. Uh, so that was great, and uh, Kate Alexander, who's the terrific uh, student organizer, the way that she started out was talking about how young King and Rosa Parks and Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Gandhi were when they first got involved in making change. And so people that think young people can't make a difference, well, that's just wrong. Young people have and do make a difference. Um, so I think that that's, as a movement, something we need to invest more in. So a lot of our chapters and affiliates will complain that it's all gray beards and gray hairs that show up to their meetings. I'm like, well, what have you done to invest in bringing young people in the organization? And often it's not much, so what do you expect? You know, e even progressives are not immune to issues of race and class and ageism, et cetera. And um, just expecting that young people are going to come because you invite them is, is difficult. You have to understand their schedules, their economic pressures, et cetera. Uh, so one of the things that uh, organizations that do have some resources, churches, uh, or peace, peace groups or justice groups, is to create some space where students can participate in the larger organization but also have their own space. Young people are very collaborative for the most part. They want to do things together. Uh, they want collaborative structures. If you're able to fund an internship position, if you're able to make room on your committees or boards for them to participate, if you're able to give them a little bit of a funding for an organizer, sometimes that can work both ways because sometimes student groups can get money out of universities, not only for their own activities, but for others as well. And I think you know there's no shortcut to building relationships and you need to talk to student groups to find 
find out what they're interested, what are their priorities. Around here, there's so many great issues, I would think, for people to tackle that it's just a question of spending the time of uh, meeting with folks and, and building those relations. And I don't know, so I did a radio interview on Tuesday, which was great, and there was a young woman named Sophie who was the president of the chapter of the Binghamton University. She was supposed to be here today, but I don't know if she didn't come and couldn't make it. But she had said that they were going to try to get some students here. So uh, I think also just, you know, sometimes student groups are able to get um, space on campus for speakers. So when you have a, a more high profile sp speaker than me, you know, have something on campus and then you'll get more student gr uh, groups to come out. In terms of targeting Lockheed Martin, it's certainly not just drones, although drones are a local example, but their work on nuclear weapons, the F-35, which is the most expensive, ridiculous boondoggle ever that's robbing money for education and for everything else. So I think, though, you do need research, and you can put pressure on the university administration to come clean. What's going on? Is Lockheed paying for this building? Are they going to be buying professorships? Are they going to be, you know, supporting graduate students? Whatever. So you have to, and students have purchase. Students or alumni or people in the community have standing to demand those answers, you know, from the university. And then it's an educational campaign. It could be an agitational campaign. It could be civil disobedience to block the bulldozers or, or whatever it is to stop the construction. I think there's a lot of handles that you could uh, grab hold of there. Thank you.